clap our hands this morning. That's true. 
true this morning You turn morning to dancing You give beauty for ashes You turn shame into glory You're the only one who can You turn morning to dancing
makes a way where there is no way. Can you just worship him this morning? Jesus, we worship you. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. Just worship him this morning. He's here. You Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place. We surrender our lives again and again, Father. Do as you will, God. We're just a vessel, Jesus. Jesus. Lord, bless me and keep me. Make your face shine upon and be gracious to me. Lord, turn his face towards you and give you peace. Yes, Jesus. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon and be gracious to you. Lord, turn his face towards you and give you peace. We receive. Amen. 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 He is for you, 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 he is for you,
and your family and your children and their children and their children may his presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around you and within you he is with you he is with you in the morning in the evening in your coming and your going in your weeping and rejoicing he is for you 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 that you watch over us, God, for a thousand generations, God. Hallelujah, God, for your mercy and your grace, God, your for forgiveness, God. Thank you, Father God, in Jesus' name. Thank you for your promises, Lord, that you've made to us, God. Lord, that, that will never end, God. They are yes and amen, God. We thank you for that. We thank you, Lord, that you are in control of this world, no matter how crazy it seems, God. Lord, you're in control, God. You're calling the shots. The enemy's not calling the shots. So, Lord, we thank you that we are part of the kingdom, God. We are part of your family. Come on through the shed blood of Jesus Christ today. Thank you, Father. Thank you for the blessing, Father. Lord, we give you praise and we give you glory, God. Prepare our hearts, God, for your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Van, for the blessing. Hey, come on, they, they, they know it's like one of my favorite songs. Come on, good to have Pastor Harlan up here singing and, and the whole crew up here. You got his shirt on? Come on, if you're on Facebook, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> we love you, Pastor Harlan. Well, good morning. All right, now I made you a promise a few weeks ago that I was going to 
I was going to come back and talk about something that I kind of left you hanging out there on. We were talking about John chapter 8, when this woman was caught in adultery, and I told you that I was going to tell you what I truly believe that Jesus wrote on the ground. How many want to know that? All right. How many remember that we talked about that? How many don't care? A couple, we have a couple don't care. Okay. So, so this is pretty interesting. It's a, uh, hopefully it's not boring to you because, uh, th- th- this story, John, John chapter eight, actually, if you have your Bibles, I'm going to find three passages of scripture, John chapter eight, find that, and then find, I always do this with you here. So I know how long it takes. All right. So John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. John chapter 8, you get there, say amen. Amen. Okay, and then find Philippians chapter 3, so just keep going to the right. Revelations, I went too far. Ephesians, Philippians is gone. Okay, all right, that's Philemon, that's not the right one. Are you there already? All right, you beat me. Philippians chapter 3, say amen. Amen. So we got John chapter 8, Philippians chapter 3, and then 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Okay, those, actually there are a few more scriptures we're going to use, but those are kind of the main ones. John chapter 8, Philippians 3, and 2 Corinthians 5. Father, I pray you just open our hearts and our minds today to your word that doesn't change, that it's faithful. Lord, it is able to discern our thoughts before we think them. We ask, Lord, that you'll be with us this morning, God. Just open our our minds, Lord, to be receptive in Jesus' name. So, Today I wanted to talk not only about what Jesus wrote. This is really inter- this passage of scripture is so interesting. I want to talk about not only what Jesus wrote on the ground, but why? Say why? Why, why he wrote it and didn't say it out loud. This is very important. Um, we're going to find out a few things for sure. Number one, this was not just a casual conversation that Jesus was having with the Pharisees. And the, and the teachers of the law, it was not just a casual conversation. This was indeed a trial that was taking place. So I'm going to show you why it was a trial. It was a trial. And number two, uh, the religious leaders that brought this woman that was caught in the very act of adultery, the Bible says, uh, they, didn't leave. they didn't leave because they were embarrassed or shamed. I'm going to show you that they left because they feared for their lives. Amen. And number three, I'm going to show you this, that legally, according to Mosaic law, the law of Moses, these guys had backed themselves into a corner. And uh, if Jesus doesn't show mercy on them, it could cost them their life. Amen. Come on, this is some serious stuff here. So everybody remembers this, the famous line, in John chapter 8, where Jesus stands up and says, let him who doesn't have sin, him without sin, cast the first stone. Um, and then the Bible says that he wrote on the ground. But I think if you re- when we read the story, which we're going to read it here in a second, you're going to find that, that before Jesus said that, he wrote something on the ground. And then he said it, then he wrote it on the ground again. So let's, I want you to pay close attention as I read this, uh, maybe closer attention than you normally would pay to the positions of the people, because remember this is a trial going on. There's a group, these, these, are, the, these are the people in the story, there is the, the crowd that Jesus was teaching, so that'll be you, okay? So there was the crowd that Jesus was teaching, there was Jesus, there was the woman that was accused of being uh, an adult, adulteress, and there were 
the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the, and the teachers of the religious law. That, that's the group of people, right? Now, as we read through this, it tells us where these people are positioned. If they're standing, if they're sitting, it, it tells us. And so, and so I want you to have, this is important. I'm, 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 I'm laying this out because it's important on, on what takes place in this story, okay? So John chapter 8, starting in verse 2. It says, now early in the morning, Jesus came to the temple, and all the people came up to him, and he sat down. So what did Jesus do? Okay, so let, I'm going to say something that's not in the scripture, but I want you to, I want you to think about it. It's common sense. If Jesus sits down, what do you think the people are doing, standing or sitting? There's, I agree with you. So Jesus sits down to teach. They sit down as well. They're in the temple. Come on, they're, they're, they're in church. You know, I'm standing because... I'm standing. All right. And so, <laughs> so he sits down and taught them. Now, verse 3, then the scribes and the Pharisees brought, to, brought him a woman caught in adultery. And, and when they had set her in the midst. Now, set, S-E-T, not sat. Set her in the midst. She's standing. I'm going to prove it to you in a minute because it says she's standing. So, so Jesus is sitting down. You're sitting down, the woman standing. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, the religious leaders, they're standing. And they said, they said to him, teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. This is, all these words are important, in the very act. They're saying they caught this woman in the very act of adultery. Now, Moses in the law commands us that such a woman should be stoned, but what do you say? That's important. They said this testing him that he might say something to which they could accuse him, but Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger, and get this, as, he, as if he didn't hear what they said. Like, like, I'm not even hearing you, okay? So Jesus writes something down, but he's acting like, I'm not hearing what you're saying. I'm not hearing you. Verse 7, so they continued. The Pharisees and Sadducees continued pressing in. They continued asking him, what do you say, you know? And he, he raised himself up, and he said this. He, he who is without sin among you, let him throw the first stone. And again, he stooped down on the ground and wrote. Okay, verse 9. Then those who heard it, what did they hear? What did they hear? This is what they heard. He who is at, without sin, let him throw the first stone. So Jesus writes something on the ground, tells them, he without sin cast the first stone. That's what they heard. And then he writes something else on the ground. So then, then those who heard it being convicted in their conscience went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone. He wasn't alone because the crowd was still there, right? The, the, he was left alone because the Pharisees and Sadducees are gone. All right. Jesus was left alone with the woman, what? Standing in the midst. Okay. Okay. You're saying, Tom, why, why are you doing that? You, you, it'll make sense in a minute. When Jesus raised himself up, remember he was down here, raised himself up, and saw no one but the woman, he said, woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And he said this, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. So what? What Jesus was writing on the ground, most of us have been taught two different things. We've been taught, number one, there's no way we know because the Bible doesn't tell us what Jesus wrote on the ground. That, that's a traditional answer. Uh, the second answer, which I, I probably even preached myself, is that, uh, that Jesus wrote down the sins of the Pharisees. Come on, that makes sense. Come on, that, that, that he would write the sins of the Pharisees. But I'm telling you, I was wrong about that. And I'm going to show you why today. See, the, the problem with the traditional answers is this, is that we presume that the, the Pharisees left because they were shamed or embarrassed. Okay? Uh, and I'm going to give you three reasons why they weren't shamed or embarrassed. First, it would be out of character for them to be shamed or embarrassed <laughs> because of who they were. Uh, Jesus publicly, come on, publicly rebuked these guys in front of everybody time and time again, 
and, and, and they never left because they were shamed or embarrassed before, right? So there was just some common sense here. They did leave because they were angry many times. They tried to kill him, and they wanted to grab him, you know, and he'd walk through the midst of them. So surprisingly, that dur- during this trial of the woman caught in adultery, Jesus never mentions the sins of the Pharisees, never mentions it. Uh, matter of fact, if you read the accounts, which I'm going to give you a whole bunch of accounts that Jesus had with the Pharisees, if you read the account, this is probably one of the most pleasant accounts that Jesus ever had with the Pharisees. So since the Pharisees were, were unswayed by Jesus' uh, continual public re- re- rebuke, uh, I, I, I don't think that they were influenced by something that he wrote on the ground. Now, I want you to think about also who could see what Jesus wrote on the ground. Now, the, the followers of Jesus were all sitting down. Now, maybe Jesus is... Uh, the disciples, they were probably in the room with them, but they were probably in the back of the room, right? Uh, not, not up front, because up front was the woman, Jesus, and the Pharisees and the Sadducees, these religious leaders, okay? Uh, and so if, if you were the crowd, could you see what, from your vantage point, could you see what Jesus wrote on the ground? Who, who could see what Jesus wrote on the ground? The Pharisees and Sadducees, and, and the woman, Okay? So that's, that's one reason. One, one reason I don't think that it was just their sins that, that, that he wrote down. Number two, uh, it, it's highly likely that these Pharisees and these Sadducees had become so wicked and so hard-hearted and so evil that where Paul talks about having your conscience seared. Listen, you, you have to have a conscience seared to protest to crucify Jesus. And most of them knowing he was an innocent man, but, but you know, he was causing them problems. And so, and so you know, they, 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 they pushed the, the, you know, they, 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 they pushed the, uh, the, the crucifixion because he was causing them so much problems. And, and so if you want to know what seared means, you know, Paul says having your conscience seared. Uh, if you've ever seen a, a cattle get branded, right? They take the cow and they, the calf and they hold it down, take a hot iron, come on, it's a searing iron, and they, and they, they put that brand on the cow. That, brand, that brand's never going to leave. It's going to be there the whole, the whole life of the cow. But where, where that searing is, and if you've ever been a, a burn victim, you understand this as well. My brother was burnt, so his legs are, he has burn victim legs. He feel, feel, feels, no, feels no pain where the burn was. You feel no pain where the searing is. And so if your conscience is seared, like I believe that these Pharisees and these Sadducees were, they, they, they weren't feeling what you and I would feel. They wouldn't feel the compassion that you and I felt, the, the compassion that Jesus showed when he preached and he taught and stuff. They weren't feeling that. They were just seeing that Jesus was a problem to them, and they wanted to try to get rid of him. And so, and so you know, Paul talks about our, our, our conscience being seared. I think that I'm speculating here, but I'm thinking that most of them probably had a seared conscience. Um, and this is what Jesus said publicly, out loud, about them on a, on a, a number of times. And if you want the, the biblical reference, I have all of them written down on, on our Facebook. So we want to welcome those that are watching online. You can just click on that. And all the scripture references of everything I'm getting ready to say right now that Jesus said are, are, on, the, are on those notes. And so you can see these notes. I'm not going to take the time to read every scripture reference. So I'm going to give you 18 things that Jesus said about them. Number one. He said they were murderers. Number two, he said they were adulterers. Number three, he said they were thieves. thieves. Number four, he said they dishonored their parents. Number five, he said they they cursed their parents. Number six, he said they did not love God. Uh, They did not love their neighbor. They devoured widows' houses, uh, did the unpardonable sin, which was blaspheme the Holy Spirit, whenever they attributed Jesus casting out demons to to the devil, they were, they were blaspheming the Holy Spirit because it was the work of the Holy Spirit that was causing those demons to leave. Right? Okay. Side, that's just a side note. Uh, they were unrepentant. They were uh, covetous. They were hypocrites. They neglected the more important matters of the law, which were justice, mercy, and faith. Uh, uh, they let go of commandment, the commandments of God and held on to the traditions of men. They swore oaths by the wrong things. They were proud, arrogant show-offs. They were blind guides, whitewashed tombs, a brood of vipers. And the Pharisees claimed that they were righteous by the law. That they were righteous by the law. Okay, Paul had a problem with that. 
So Paul reminds us that your righteousness does not come from the law. Your righteousness does not come from your good works. Your righteousness does not come from the way you dress. Your righteousness that you have comes from Jesus Christ. Amen. Philippians chapter 3. You should be there. Philippians chapter 3 verse 8. Paul says this. I'm reading from the New King James. Yet, indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, that I might gain Jesus and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Jesus, the righteousness which is from God by faith. So the Pharisees certainly were not made righteous by the law. The Bible is saying is that we are made righteous through what Jesus did on the cross, right? By, by us accepting by us accepting Jesus Christ, the Bible says that God imputes righteousness to us. So, so listen, you, you're not going to be righteous. You've already been made righteous by the blood of Jesus Christ. You, you can walk in righteousness today. That doesn't mean that we always do right things. But, but when God looks at us, you know what? He looks at us through the blood of Christ, and he sees us righteous. Come on, that's some good news today. But the Pharisees and the Sadducees were trying to be righteous according to the law of Moses, which was impossible that, that's why Jesus said this, uh, for I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the teachers of the law and the Pharisees, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of God. That your righteousness needs to be above the righteousness of the, the Pharisees and the, and the Sadducees and the teachers of the law. Th therefore, it, it's, it's highly likely that the Pharisees and these teachers of the law had become evil by a seared conscience and... Uh, so I, I don't think that for that reason that it was their sins that Jesus wrote down that caused them to be embarrassed and leave. Third, this is important too. Uh, you notice that when, when Jesus was talking to the Pharisees and the Sadducees and accused them of all these things, that he always did it as a group. He, he didn't point out one and say, you did this or you're doing that. He, he, when, when he was accusing them, he did it as a group, and here's why is because if he didn't see them do that, he would have sinned. If he didn't see them do that, he would have slandered them because this is what slander means. So slander means accusing someone of anything that you did not see them do yourself. That's why, that's why in a court of law, you can't say, well, somebody told me that they did that. You have to be the person that saw it yourself. Otherwise, you know what? You're not a witness or you're slandering, right? And so, and so if Jesus didn't see them... Um, you know, uh, you know, dishonor their parents. If he didn't see them, you know, uh, dishonor widows and, and orphans. If he didn't see them do that himself, and he accused them of doing that as an individual, he would be he would be slandering them. And we know this that he never sinned, right? So Leviticus nineteen sixteen. I'm going to give you a couple of Levitical laws here. It says, "Do not spread slanderous gossip among your people." Do not stand idly by when your neighbor's life is threatened. I am the Lord. So whenever Jesus accused the Pharisees of, of these various sins, he never accused them as individuals. He always accused them as a group, which made them even more mad. Right? It didn't embarrass them. So for those reasons, I don't think that it was their sin that Jesus that Jesus wrote on the ground that caused these guys to drop their rocks and, and leave. Now, I want to remind you that this was a trial. And I'm going to show you why it was a trial right now. Uh, before I do that, you, you remember the story in, in Luke chapter 12 uh, where this man says to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide my inheritance with me. And Jesus answered and said, uh, Man, who appointed me judge or arbitrator between you? Remember that story? Okay. You know, m most of the time we would take that scripture to say, well, you know, Jesus is saying we're not supposed to judge. That's not what he was saying at all. He was saying that he had not been appointed as the judge or arbitrator in that case. Otherwise, he would have been glad to, to arbitrate the case. But he had not been appointed to arbitrate that case. And so he said, who appointed me to be judge or arbitrator in this case? What Jesus was doing was 
was basically following the Jewish custom of what Jethro, who was Moses' dad, when Moses was trying to lead a, you know, these two million Israelites out there in the wilderness and trying to judge all their stuff by himself. And Jethro said, you're going to kill yourself. He said, you need to, you need to get, have some godly men, come on, appoint judges to, to, to judge these things. And so, and so Jesus was following this, this advice, really, that, that the Pharisees and the Sadducees followed. They, they were the ones who appointed judges. Okay? I'm, I'm, I'm making a point here. Everybody with me so far? So, and this is exactly what happened in this trial. Because when, when this trial started, they bring this woman to Jesus, and they say, Jesus, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act of adultery. Now, Moses and the law says that she should be stoned to death. What do you have to say? When, when they said, what do you have to say, the trial just began. They were the religious leaders. They had the ability to appoint a judge. They just appointed Jesus to be the judge. Amen. But listen, Jesus is smart. He's not dumb. You're going to see this. So the Pharisees, when they said, now what do you have to say, just appointed Jesus to be the judge. Now, now he was legally the judge in this case, and that he could now order the execution of this woman caught in adultery. He could do that. But he could also order the execution of any false witness which were the teachers of the law and the Pharisees. Now, when the Pharisees brought the woman, Levitical law, Leviticus 20.10 says this, bring both the adulterer and the adulteress as well as two or three witnesses of the act. So they had to actually see these people in the act of adultery. So that's what, that's what the Levitical law says. And, and because they didn't bring the adulterer, they only brought the one accused of being the adulteress. Uh, there was a problem here. Amen. See, if the Pharisees didn't actually catch this woman in the act of adultery, and there was no adulteress, then they were now on trial for false witnessing. So these guys had backed themselves into a corner legally that they couldn't get out of. Now, here, here's Deuteronomy chapter 19. So listen, these guys, they studied this. I mean, that, that they studied this law. That, that all these guys knew the law. They knew you didn't have to, you, you could just tell them Deuteronomy you know, uh, 16, 19, or whatever, and they would know what it said. They memorized this thing, and they studied it, so they knew the law. So Deuteronomy chapter 19, 16 says this. If a malicious witness takes a stand to accuse someone of a crime, this is really important. If a malicious witness takes a stand to accuse somebody of a crime, the two people involved in the dispute must stand in the presence of the Lord before the priests and the judges who are in the office at the time. The judge must make a thorough investigation. And if the witness is proved to be a liar, giving false testimony against their fellow Israelite, due to the false witness as the witness is intended to do to the other party... You must purge the evil from among you. The rest, the rest of your, uh, the people will hear and this and be afraid and never again do such an evil thing among you. Show no pity, life for life, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, hand for hand, foot for a foot. It was the death penalty. That if you were a false witness, if you lied and you were caught lying, that it says show no pity, no questions asked, you had to be killed. You had to be put to death. Okay, so, so as, a, as an appointed judge, just follow me on this. I have my, 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 my legal case I'm, I'm presenting to you. So as the appointed judge, Jesus could have easily explained to the crowd of people, because that's who's hearing this, right? He could explain to the crowd of people that if you bring somebody accused of adultery, you need to have both the adultery and the, 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 the man and the woman, and then you also need to have witnesses. He, he could have said that out loud. Now, had he, had he said that out loud, being the judge, the people would have to execute the, the, the penalty. 
on the false witnesses. Remember, God, God's law forbids showing mercy to a false witness, Deuteronomy 19.16. So, so to avoid committing sin, Jesus would have had no choice than to have these guys executed because they were false witnesses. Okay? Now, that would have messed up the course of history. And, and, and Jesus wasn't, wasn't trying to sidetrack the cross. He was on his way to the cross. So think about this. To, to avoid being forced into ordering their execution, Jesus had to write on the ground and not say it out loud of, of, of what their sin was, of, of what they were doing wrong. And so, and so I was going to do an illustrated time thing, but I don't have time because I, I was going to be Jesus, and, uh, and I couldn't find an adulteress, and so... And I, I didn't want to accuse any of you guys of being Pharisees and Sadducees, and so we, you know, because you're bitter now. And so, and so I want you to imagine you're, you're the crowd, you're there. Jesus is standing here, the woman standing here, and behind, behind here is all the Pharisees and the Sadducees, right? Right? And, we're, we're, and you guys are city, sitting. Remember, that's the whole story. You're sitting, and so what? What Jesus writes on the ground? This is what I think he writes on the ground. Leviticus 20:10. Produce the adulterer or be executed as a false witness. Now, he writes this on the ground. Now, can you see that? Yes. No, you can't. <laughs> you can't see that. You know who can see it? Jesus can see it. The woman can see it. And all the Pharisees can see it. But listen, these guys had the gall. Remember, I said that their conscience were seared. The Bible says that they kept on, even after Jesus stoops down and writes on the ground, produce the adulterer or be executed as a false witness. The Bible says that they continued. They continued. And, then, and so that now Jesus stands up and he says this, let him who's without sin <laughs> cast the first stone. Okay. Now these guys know they're probably in a little bit of trouble. Because if, if they don't produce an adulterer real quick, come on, they are automatically deemed false witnesses. Does this make sense? Yeah. Okay. So the Pharisees and the Sadducees see what Jesus writes. The crowd didn't see it. Produce the adulterer or be executed as a, as a, as a false witness. Jesus showed these guys mercy when they didn't deserve mercy. You know why? You know, I, if I was playing Jesus, I probably would have said, sorry, guys. Let me tell you what you did wrong. <laughs> and then everybody kill him. But, you know, <laughs> come on. That's, that's why I'm not Jesus. And so, <laughs> so before the trial starts, Jesus writes, writes on the ground and, and reminds these guys of the penalty of being a false witness. He's reminding them. Produce the adulterer or be executed. Now, the, the, the words have not been verbally spoken, so... You as the crowd don't know what's going on. This is just a little private trial going on between the, the, the accusers, come on, the accusers and, and the, the woman and Jesus. Um, and Jesus chooses not to say it out loud again because if he said it out loud, then he would be obligated, what, because he's the judge, he would be obligated to basically execute the false witnesses. Does that make sense? Okay, so they're still standing there, though. They're still standing there. And so, and now Jesus has, has just stood up and said, all right, you without sin, throw the first stone. And he maybe points to what they should be looking at. And they're still standing there. So he thought, I need to write something else. So he gets down here and writes again, Leviticus 17.6. He probably didn't even have to write it out. He just had to write Leviticus 17.6, which says, two or three witnesses are required to put someone to death. Which one of you actually witnessed this woman in adultery? And, and so now, that's written down there. What does the Bible say? The Bible says, beginning with the oldest. Why? Because they were the smartest. They were con convicted in their conscience. What were they convicted in their conscience for? They were convicted in their conscience because they were being false witnesses. Does this make sense? And so, being convicted in their conscience, they began to, 
to leave one by one, the Bible says. Now all the false witnesses are gone. Now, here's, because, because these things weren't said out loud, there was no charges brought against the woman, really, because, because the accusers dropped their charges. Because they dropped their rocks and split, right? And so, and so now it's, it's Jesus left standing there. I, I say alone, probably because she's here. The crowd's there. Jesus is standing here. The, the Pharisees and Sadducees are all gone. And he says this, uh, woman, where are they? And maybe he points down to the two or three witnesses. Where are they that accuse you? And she said, there are none, Lord. And he, and he says, well, neither do I condemn you. Jesus declared, now go and leave your life of sin. Do you know what? He, Jesus never said she did it. She may have. She may have been an adulteress in the past, and that's why they, that's why they, they chose her to, but, but Jesus didn't see that. And evidently, these guys were not actually witnesses of it. They just heard, come on, heard rumors around town. You know, you, you hear rumors around town that this woman was an adulteress, and so she was the one that they chose. So what Jesus wrote on the ground didn't embarrass these guys. What Jesus wrote on the ground caused them to fear for their life because if they would have went ahead and made these accusations, they would have been false witnesses, and they would have had to been executed. Okay. Does that make sense? So, when we read this story, there are people who say, well, Jesus, kinda, Jesus kind of uh, excused the law of Moses. He did not excuse the law of Moses. Because if he, if he would excuse the law of Moses, he, he, he had to live, while he was on this earth, he had to live according to the law of Moses. So, if he had excused the law of Moses, he would have sinned. And if he sinned, then you know what? Then, our, then, our, then he would have been the, the sacrifice and the penalty for, paid the penalty for our sins. And so, what, what he did is, I wrote down two more legal terms here. Jesus followed the letter of the law, but he also allowed the spirit of the law. Now, if you've ever been in a court case, you understand what I'm talking about. The letter of the law says this, that the letter of the law says you have to do exactly what the law says. The spirit of the law looks for areas where you can find mercy and grace and, and, and get around it. Okay, And so Jesus demonstrated both the letter of the law and the spirit of the law with this woman. Now, you know, I told you a couple weeks ago I got a speeding ticket. I wasn't bragging about it, ma'am. Uh, uh, I got a speeding ticket, and, and the cop was a nice cop, very nice cop. Uh, really nice to both Christy and I, and, and we were nice to him and thanked him, actually, for pulling us over because we'd watched John Brevere. You know, he was working for God at the time. Pulls us over, and, you know, and I was 17 miles over in the speed. I actually did not know I was, I knew I was driving 55, but I didn't know it was a 35. And so there was a problem. And so the letter of the law says that he has to write me a ticket. That's what the letter of the law says. Now, the spirit of the law says that he has, Chrissy reminded me this morning, that he has the ability to overlook that law and allow me to go. He didn't. He went, he went by the letter of the law and gave me a $152 ticket. And so, <laughs> praise the Lord. He was doing his job. He was working for the king. So, in this case, Jesus followed the letter of the law. He did exactly what the law says, but he allowed the spirit of the law. Come on, thank God for the spirit of the law. So, he didn't abolish, he didn't abolish the law of Moses he fulfilled everything that he was supposed to fulfill, yet, the Bible says, without sin. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.21. For God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Come on, you are righteous today. Hallelujah. You're righteous today because Jesus went to the cross, because he paid the payment for our sin. I wrote down just three things we can learn from this, uh, from this passage. One is this, is that God, 
God does not change his law or change his word to line up with our lives. And, you know, God has given us the, the, the word. This is the word of God. This is, this is the moral absolute. You have to have a moral absolute in life. This, we believe, is the moral absolute. This is the word of God. So we have to have something that we can go by, and so this is what we go by. So people that don't go by it, you know what? I mean, they have to, they're going to have to answer to God for what they go by. We go by this. And so, and so God never changes what he's written in here to line up with our lives. But he also doesn't change his grace and his mercy. The Bible says that's new every morning. Great is his faithfulness towards us. So we can learn that from the story. But we can also learn this is that we will we'll all one day stand before a righteous judge. We are going to stand before Jesus. Um, and as believers, we're going to be judged for our actions, for, for what we've done here in, in life. Not for punishment, but for reward. And so and if our If our motives in doing what we have done is correct and right, the Bible says that it's going to be gold and silver and it's going to be great. But if if the good works and the the things that we thought were righteous, the things that we did maybe for the wrong motive, uh, uh, the Bible says they will be tried by fire. And if they're they're wood and stubble and hay, they're going to be burned up. And it says, you're still going to get to go to heaven. You just lost your reward. So your motives, come on, say motives. Your motives in... Why you do what you do matters, okay? And so we're going to stand before a righteous judge, and, and, and that judge is going to be Jesus. And, and, you know, this is not we might stand before him or we may stand before him. You will stand before him. The Bible says that, that everyone will stand before him and that every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. So you have the opportunity to do that on earth and receive eternal life and become righteous in God, or you can take your chances. Now, the, the third thing that, that I wrote down here is that God's already required or provided the required righteousness that we need to enter heaven, and that is through the sacrifice that Jesus paid on the cross. That, that's why it's so important that, that we have a relationship with Jesus, that, that, we, that we allow Jesus to come into our lives and, and the Holy Spirit comes in us, and the Bible says, and then the Holy Spirit, Pastor Clint talked about this last week, is the guarantee. Come on, the Holy Spirit is the guarantee that you get to go to heaven. That, that when, you, when you stand before God, that it's, it's the Holy Spirit's presence that allows you to go into heaven. Because he's the down payment, the Bible says. He's the guarantee that, that come on, guarantee, that's a good thing. It's guaranteed. Come on. You know, we, 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 we probably discount that word so often because... Things we buy are guaranteed, and then they're not really guaranteed. They're like, oh, no, the guaranteed ran out. That went to when you walked out the door, the guaranteed end. You know? But the Bible says that, that the Holy Spirit is given to us as a down payment or a guarantee that when we stand before God, that he will see, come on, the righteousness in us through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, and you get to go to heaven. Now, look, there are another group of people that will try to get to heaven on the merits of their own righteousness. Now, those are people that... that have heard the gospel. They've heard that, you know, for us to go to heaven, we need to receive Christ. We need to admit that we're sinners, humble ourselves, repent of our sins, ask Christ in our life. They've heard that their entire life, but they thought, you know what? I'm going to try this on my own. I'm a pretty, pretty doggone good person. And so when I stand before God, I'm going to tell them, listen, I gave money to the poor and I helped them homeless guys. Come on. And I did all these good things. And so, and so based on that, you should let me into heaven. And Jesus said, you know what? Your righteousness, let me compare it to something. Do you have any filthy rags? Because your righteousness is the same as a filthy rag to me. You know what? I provided everything that you needed to have eternal life in heaven through the shed blood of my son on that cross, and you rejected it. Therefore, you will not enter into heaven. You will, at that point, bow your knee, like the Bible says, that Every knee will bow, and they will confess that Jesus is Lord. But at that point, it's too late. They've made their choice. So, listen, while we're alive on this earth is the time that God gives us to make that choice. Now, there are people that have deathbed conversions. And listen, they get to go to heaven. They repented. They believed. They get to go to heaven. Deathbed conversions. But you know what? I'm not chancing that. Come on, because death could come faster than your repentance. 
You see what I'm saying? So if you're watching online today or you're here today, you have the opportunity to become the righteousness of God through a relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, now most of us in this room, if, if you've done that, raise your hand. You've done that. that. That means that you've received Jesus as your Lord and Savior. That you have the guarantee the Holy Spirit lives inside you. Come on. There's not enough hands going up here. Uh, okay. I don't want to make you raise your hand, but you know what? You should be able to raise your hand. Okay, now if you've not done that, if you've not done that, if you, and you couldn't raise your hand, I appreciate your honesty. Today, come on, you can become, this is a great deal. Today, God will take your sin and remove it as far as east is from the west and not remember it anymore. So everything that you've ever done wrong in the past will be gone. And then, and then, and then he's going to impute to you, that means he's going to give you righteousness through not through yourself through the shed blood of jesus and so when you stand before god the holy spirit's inside you he says you know what you're a child of mine come on into heaven for eternity eh? come on eternity's a long time a long time so if you've not done that today you can do that and, and actually i want to give you the chance to do that today and then and then after you do that i, I got some things i want to talk to you about on an on an, on an, another topic so let's bow your heads real quick what we're looking for today is anybody in this room or you're watching online that you've really not made Jesus the Lord of your life. You've not repented of your sins. You've not asked him to come in your life. If that's you today, then you can do that. The Bible says that he'll hear your sin or he'll hear your prayer and forgive your sin. With your heads bowed today, those in this room, is there anybody in here? I'm not going to embarrass you again, and I'm not going to have you come forward today for sake of time. But if you're here today and you say, Pastor Tom, I, I don't know if I'd go to heaven today if I died in my current condition. Would you raise your hand so I can pray for you? I'm looking. I'm looking. Is there any in the room that, that you would just acknowledge the fact that you're just not positive that you'd go to heaven? I see one hand. Is there anybody else? Anybody else today? You're just not sure you'd go to heaven. This is not a time to, to be embarrassed about that. This is a time to make it right with Jesus. I'm not asking you to join the church. I'm asking you to join the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. Is there anybody else in here? We got one. And there may be some that are watching online. Let's pray this prayer today. And, and we're just going acknowledge the fact that we need Jesus in our life. Say this out loud. Say, Jesus, Jesus I, believe I believe that you're the Son of God. Son of God. I believe you died for my sins. I believe God raised you from the dead, and I'm a sinner, and I ask you to forgive me of my sin. I repent. Come in my life. Give me the Holy Spirit. Help me live for you today and the rest of my days. In Jesus' name. Now, let me ask you, where's Jesus? Come on. He's inside you. The Holy Spirit's inside you. Come on. You have eternal life. The Bible says that the angels in heaven rejoice. Yes, amen. Angels in heaven rejoice. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. We know Richard's going to be there. Amen. Amen. Okay.